when I think about being interested in science, it's just thinking about where to start. Where did I first begin thinking about it? And I was one of those kids that was a why kind of a kid. Why is the why is it working? Why does it do that? Why? 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 And so, if you like look at the world in that kind of way, you have to start looking for some answers and the answers are embedded in science. So it's not a sort of, oh, I, I started thinking about science when I was you know, 12 and a half and I you know, saw a, a, a comet or whatever. <laughs> it's like just part of the world. And for me, I think science is so part of our everyday life. It's almost like, how can you avoid it? How can you avoid being interested in science? When you have a burn, it's it can really knock your wheels off and then it's very obvious if you've got a massive burn and you may see this on you know you see in the movie or something it's very obvious that the that that skin is so badly damaged it can no longer function what we see though is that you don't have to have a massive burn for your whole body to be knocked out of kilter your skin is a really interesting I could talk about skin forever it's a receptor it's our interface with the world you know I think it was Spike Milligan said it's a beautiful thing is skin it helps to keep your body in yeah and so this is our interface vitamin D temperature regulation sensory interface we clearly understand that there's a psychological component blushing uh, eczema is worse when we're stressed etc there's a, a huge amount of functionality in skin that we take for granted. That's damaged. The inflammatory response, the drive of our body, from our immune system, our driving that inflammation to try and heal it, again, has, uh, is associated with collateral damage. And we have the injury itself, we have the response to the injury, and we know that it affects all our body systems. It affects the heart, the liver, the lungs, the brain. And certainly we've become much more interested in how the brain is affected and how the nerves are affected within the skin because we see that the skin is a receptor. It's like the eye, you know. So because the eye, you know, does black and white and color, but the skin uh, needs to be considered in that context. Certainly we need a blood supply to heal. Certainly we need skin cells to heal. We need a source of cells. We need the frameworks. But when we look at self-organization, what actually makes us our shape? Well, how do we get the feedback from that? How do we actually drive to that shape? How do we take the ge genetic material in all these different cells and we come up with different shapes? You know, so I, I have a hypothesis, because <laughs> I haven't proven, but we've got some, some chinks in the armor that the nervous system is the key to that. The nervous system is key to driving our, our construct into a regenerative pattern. So, but a small burn, you lose your functionality and even if you pair it right back, you're no longer waterproof. You leak fluid and you're no longer bacteria proof or, or fungal proof or any, any sort of invader can get in. So you've lost your protective layer, so bugs can get in water can get out and that is a bad combination so we need to repair that and protect whilst it's repairing as quickly as we possibly can we have a mantra in our burns unit that i uh, always shout from the rooftops every intervention from the point of injury will influence the scar wall for life and i think we should hold hands and say it but every intervention starts at the point of injury so anybody can influence their scar by clean cool running water 15 to 18 degrees for 20 minutes within the first hour of injury, you will close down the collateral damage, you will remove the heat away, and you will facilitate that healing straight up. Keep it a cleaner as well, keeps it clean, and reduces the bacteria load, reduces the sort of bug populations, and then it starts you on a healing pattern. Then, oh, it's, you know, it's a complex and, and challenging road, and it's associated with severe pain. And you, I know that that pain that must be there for a reason and so to protect ourselves and all, but what else is it there for? Is it to drive the cells in our body to that zone, to guide them to that zone to facilitate healing? And so the healing process in burns, we want to be regenerative. We want really, this is the, the sort of holy grail, we want it, we want the sort of gecko's tail to grow back again. <laughs> and, and somewhere along the line, of evolution, we lost that capacity. 
And so all but very small injuries, you, the capacity to regenerate like that is overwhelmed. And we go down the scar path. What we want to do is understand how we can knock the scar over here to regeneration. So we get soft, supple skin that doesn't lock people in scar. And scar itself isn't just about the way it looks. A scar actually impacts on your function. Temperature control is a very obvious one if it's a big area, but it impacts on your movement. Again, a very obvious one. It's not just about how it looks. It impacts, it's itchy. You know, if you don't sleep every night because half the night you're awake because it's itchy, the whole of your, the dominoes start to fall, you know, and it impacts on the whole of your life. Many years ago, we, uh, in our research, uh, we always started thinking, well, how can we get funds to do our research? We work in a very small group, in a very small niche area, and so, uh, and we cross a whole lot of boundaries from population health, to cell biology, to neurophysiology, to clinical medicine, uh, all sorts of, we have projects going in cardiology and psychology and all, we're ologies. <laughs> and there's lots of uh, work going on that pertain to somebody that's injured from burns and it's all being clinically focused, really driving to solve the clinical problem. So it's a very translational, multidisciplinary. So we know we're not really very uh, competitive in, in a lot of the funding arenas. So many years ago, Marie and I started in the uh, Macomb Research Foundation, and people were very generous, and it supported our research for a very long time. And uh, I, Mr. Harold Macomb is a great plastic surgeon. He was the patron, and I was the chair. And as we've gone along, uh, with the with, uh, and succession planning, I've handed the Fiona Wood Foundation, and I'm still obviously involved, and very much so at the, ta at the sort of my shoulder to the wheel. But uh, the first thing my colleagues did was uh, they moved from the McComb Foundation to the Fiona Wood Foundation, now I'm sort of the patron. And, and so it is our vehicle uh, for people's generosity to support us. And it, it, that we have got some great supporters uh, in that people like Woodside have supported us for, for a very long time, and the Chevron and Western Power, and so lots of corporate supporters and people like uh, our, our very generous folks like uh, the Perrin family and the McCuskers, and and then but then there's a load of a telethon, of course, uh, and I'm sure I'm going to forget someone, so it's really bad. And Lottery West, and so lots of people have supported, but lots of individuals have supported us that are far too many to, to name, but they all know who they are. And you know, whether they're doing a run for a reason or, or just pop in that uh, donation in the post or, or just being uh, helpful and helping us with our research in, in any way, shape or form, it's meant that we've been able to get a long way uh, and help a lot of people. So the Fiona Wood Foundation is the banner we've run under that links our research with our clinical work. Spraying our skin cells is a, a fascinating story for me because it's uh, now coming up to 20 years of my life and I could probably encompass it in a few minutes. <laughs> and the drive was really around trying to understand how we could cover really burns which were large surface area. If you've got a burn, and traditionally, and the, we still use traditional techniques as well as the uh, cell-based therapies here, but if you, if you traditionally we would take a pair, uh, area of your body you're not injured, skim a skin graft off the top, allow that area to heal, move your skin graft and put it on the wound. And you can imagine if you've got half of your body burn, well that's quite challenging, because how are you going to take the other half, and then you've now got a, all of your body is wounded, and so we spent a lot of time over the years, and, and uh, not just here, of course, but uh, globally in the burns arena, trying to expand uh, the, the donor site. So whether we put it through a machine that meshes it, or like a string vest, or all sorts of different strategies and different layers that we can introduce, uh, scaffolds and dressings that are coated in biologics or like in various molecules. And so the skin cells of the uh, of the dermal epidermal junction, the two main layers of skin, your waterproof layer and your tough layer. And the, two, the layer in between, the dermal epidermal junction, is where is the engine room. 
and that's where the skin regenerates from. So the idea uh, that came out of MIT in Boston in the 70s is that you can peel those two layers apart like a bread and butter sandwich. You scrape the butter off, you put it in a, a, a favorable environment and you can grow the cells into sheets. That's where we started and based on Reinwald and Green's work, growing skin cells into sheets because we skin graft in sheets. And before long, we started here, with Marie Stone and I, in a, with a lab funded by Telethon in 1993. And then we realized that the skid cell sheets that did better were the ones with, that looked like they were a bit moth-eaten because they weren't quite as mature. And we thought, this is interesting. And so we did some experiments looking at the cells and how the surface of the cells changes with the maturity. So when you get a cell, we, when we split all these cells apart, they're all, they're all dissociated, they're all apart from each other, and they're looking for a mate. <laughs> and they connect, and then they start to form a sheet, and then that, once they get that sheet, they then start to form layers. And so, which is a very sort of, you, then those layers eventually become waterproof. So it's the normal sort of way of going. But interestingly, then when you take that and put it on the body, it was really hard to get it to stick and it was very fragile and really difficult to use and took three weeks. So we thought, hmm, this is interesting. The cells, when they're on their own, are much stickier. Do they stick to the wound better? And we looked at how the skin cells grew into a, a sheet in a box and we looked at how the skin cells on the body as, a, as like in a soup Healed. And we thought, hmm, this is interesting. And so we, we started putting the cells in like a blister of dressing made uh, over the wound. And that was messy and difficult. Or for a hand, we put it in a surgical glove and allowed them to, uh, the patient to move the hand and the cells would coat the hand and things like that. And one day we just thought, oh, we should just spray this on. The two of us looked at each other, whoa. Yeah. And so we, we tried uh, all sorts of different ways of spraying went to the art store and the chemist store, the pharmacy, and the anaesthetic trolley. That's a very good source of sprayers, throat spray, <laughs> etc., hairspray. And we found an Italian mouth freshener that had a nozzle that if we took that nozzle and put it onto a syringe, it would, on a five mil syringe standard, it would maintain 90% plus viability coming through with no dead space. It was ridiculously simple. And so that's how we started spraying skin cells on. Then we think, well, we've now, we've, we were three weeks in the lab to grow a, a, a mature sheet. Marie managed to grow really very good quality sheets in 10 days. We started using suspension at five days uh, post-harvesting. And then that's still five days you're waiting. And, and then that's five painful days. <laughs> And so uh, we th stood back and thought, well, could the body be the tissue culture flask? So we put it in tissue culture flask. Could we use the body as a tissue culture flask? So the, the surgery has to be meticulous. You have to be clean, no bleeding, no dead tissue, etc. But the answer is yes. So we then put the first steps of the whole lab process in a box and took the box to the patient. And that's what we do now. So it takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And so it was, that's like 20 years of my life. <laughs> but but you know, now I'm seeing all sorts of interesting uh, utilizations going forward. It's still in trials in the US with the uh, uh, AFER, the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine. There's colleagues in the UK using it head and neck uh, reconstruction in, for pigment change, for acne scarring and more recently one of my colleagues is looking at exploring the use of these cells to change radiotherapy scarring you know, so and chronic wounds all sorts of things so when I see what everybody else is doing I thought oh this is really good because I can learn from them and see how it's sort of growing and uh, moving across the world for basically skin repair but we we need skin repair in all sorts of different ways so so it's uh, good to see that it's having the boundaries pushed